Hello, welcome to Joey on the Kirby Weather Dude YouTube channel. Once again, please hit like, share, and subscribe. This morning, I'm sitting here with meteorologist Mark Engels down there in Surrey, British Columbia. I'm up here in Wells, BC. Uh, we don't have that much of an earthquake threat here in Wells. Uh, we're in a very, very dead zone. In fact, the last time there was a big earthquake in the north that everybody felt, we didn't. We have this nice fractured rock that seems to really absorb. It's just a great place to live in Wells. That's not so the case for Mark down there in Surrey, but uh, he's happy to find out that there is an early warning detection system now available in Canada that's been operating already in Japan and the United States for a while. And, uh, well, the show is called Bad News, but uh, maybe this is good news. Let's go. That's what this film is all about. Duck and cover. There it is. This is bad news. My God. Falling out right now. Anything can happen. Get on! Wow. I'll watch the video later. Feel the heat. They ain't dry mopping this. It's a bomb, duck and cover. This episode is brought to you by Wildfire Floods and Chaos Communications Podcast. That's right, communicationspodcast.ca. Tim Conrad and his, his crew of information officers, they've responded to wildfires and floods all over Western Canada. And maybe someday they'll respond to earthquakes too. So this episode is sponsored by them, communicationspodcast.ca. Okay, I'm here with Mark Engels, meteorologist Mark Engels, who is also a geologist. And although uh, people don't know this about me, I spent many years of my life working as a prospector. So uh, geology is something that I have a great, great passion for as well. So I'm sitting here with Mark this morning to talk about geological things. A new early warning detection system. Mark, early warning detection system, what does this mean for people? Is it, does, it mean, does it mean we will know before an earthquake starts to happen? Or is this an earthquake warning as in the earthquake is happening? Yeah, it, uh, this does not predict earthquakes. Um, and, uh, and my daughter is now talking to me as I talk, but that's okay. Uh, this does not predict earthquakes. What we're, what we're looking at is we have an array set up of seismographs. And what they do is they, once three seismographs detect an earthquake, it can pin down the location. And because of how technology is nowadays, we, it can transmit, like it can detect and say, this is a big one. And then it will blast out an alert to everybody's phones saying there's an earthquake coming, get in shelter now. And earthquakes move remarkably fast. I don't remember the exact speed, but you know, here in Surrey, our main earthquake threat is from offshore uh, Vancouver Island. And uh, if it were to detect an earthquake offshore, like right now, text me, I would probably have about 25 seconds and that's easily 300 kilometers away from me. That's the, uh, that's the real thing is it is it detects earthquakes and it notifies people with 10 to 30 seconds of notice. Um, this is obviously not enough time to do a whole lot. It's enough time to basically get under a table, um, drop cover and hold on is the term that they use. Um, get under a table, hold on to it, embrace yourself for when the earthquake is going to hit your location. So give mm -hmm. us a brief moment here. We're mm -hmm. making sure that nothing is going to come down in the yeah. studio here. And it is going for uh, quite a bit, everybody. I, it continues it, it, this is a to, very strong to rattle earthquake. pretty strong here. 821 here on the air. We're experiencing very strong shaking. Wow. I think we need to get under the desk. All right, we're going to go to break. Uh, we'll, we'll be, be right, right back, back we'll after right this. Back. Wow. That's what this film is all about. Duck and cover. Well, that little bit of time can make a very big difference too. That's the thing that people don't realize that uh, taking, you know, you get 30 seconds to react. You know, what can you do in 30 seconds? Well, you could stop your vehicle. Uh, you could, I don't know, maybe not go into a underground tunnel. <laughs> you know, if well, you're yeah, driving down I'm, the Massey Tunnel, you, for example. I'm glad you brought that up. The Massey Tunnel has actually had this set up specifically for the tunnel. And for those that don't know, the Massey Tunnel carries highway 99 under the fraser river here in the lower mainland so it's the main it's the main highway connecting seattle to vancouver um it's very busy and it it has gates installed so that if an earthquake is detected the gates will automatically close with hopefully enough time to get people also out of the tunnel but the point is that it will limit the number of people in the tunnel for when the shaking starts um this also is in place for bridges. Um, I know in Japan, their early earthquake system is also connected to a lot of heavy machinery, like at, um, factories and stuff, and elevators will automatically stop on the closest floor and open the doors. Um, this is really the main goal because, again, 30 seconds is not a lot of time, but it's enough time to do something. 
Um, and not not everybody will have 30 seconds. You know, if in, in, in this scenario of an earthquake off Vancouver Island, if you're in Tofino, you know, you, you may have five seconds. If you're in Victoria, you may have 15 sort of thing. But the idea is that little bit of time gives people and also automated systems the time to uh, get into some state that is better than not knowing at all. Well, to get into the most solid part of your house, for example, to get into a solid doorway, to get into that, you know, whatever is actually, the most re- actually, reinforced place. We do not do solid doorways now. That's been disproven as being a, that's been disproven as being a place to go. Oh, so the, what do we do? Unsolid doorways, or yeah, right. Your your Jello doorways. Um, no, you you get on, the safest place to be is under a table. The doorway is more stable than other parts of your house but the real threat is crap falling on you um and so like if you're in your doorway but your roof caves in a meter away that's still gonna hit you um so you go under your table and your table is hopefully enough to block it. That's probably the most stable surface that you have to get under in your house is a table. You know, and even then, uh, we laughed, you know, we were laughing on the show the other night about the duck end cover back in the atomic era and how, um, you know, really advertising this idea that, hey, just duck end cover when the atomic bomb goes off. But the reality was, I was saying that if you're not in the immediate blast radius where you get vaporized, the test that they did back in the atomic era where people would, they put mannequins underneath the behind a staircase at the bottom of the, you know, in some secure location down, you know, some hiding behind something. They put these mannequins in different places and look at, you know, one was inside, uh, you know, a reinforced place inside of the uh, the center of the house, right? So just the, which mannequins survived, which ones did not, and uh, we found that duck and cover actually would buy you a good chance of survival if you're not right in the immediate blast zone. So I think the same is true with earthquakes. You know, 20, 30 seconds may be enough time for you to get yourself to a better location as long as right, you that's it. That's, can react that's exactly immediately. Right. That's exactly right. The, uh, the, if you're old enough to remember the nuclear blast drills, that's what you do for an earthquake as well. Um, I know a lot of schools, I don't know about here in the lower mainland specifically, but when I went to elementary school in Tacoma, Washington, We did earthquake drills. I know that a lot of the kids in Washington and Oregon do it. The P wave, then the S wave. And the P waves, the P waves, um, so there's two different types of earthquake waves. And I don't remember specifically like a lot of stuff. The the S, the, the P waves move faster. And this is what the, uh, the sensors are picking up on initially. And so you can see here, the sensors pick it up. It goes, the data goes to the data center. It gets blasted out to homes and that train that's going through and whatnot. And you can see the train stops before the S waves, the sh- severe shaking makes it to the, uh, the train. So if a train is stopped, it is less likely to be derailed. If you are in an elevator in a high rise, if that elevator is connected to the system, then it will stop on the nearest floor and let you out before the shaking gets there. Um, if you are in your house, and you get this text message on your phone, you get under a table. And assuming you are not within like 100 kilometers of the earthquake, you will have time to get get brace yourself. And these heavy machinery will also have time to brace to limit the amount of damage and uh, injuries that occur in such an earthquake. The P wave moves faster than the shit wave. Aha. Uh-huh. I think P is primary and S is secondary, actually. Makes so sense. it's the first and the second wave. When people get an alert blasted to their phone, whether that's a tornado warning or like the evacuation that was blasted out for the Chilcotin landslide, people people often check for a second line of confirmation before they take action. And in this instance, with if you get a text message that says an earthquake's coming, you don't have time to do that because uh, a lot of times it takes a couple minutes for like, if there's an earthquake on the coast, it'll take a couple minutes for it to get into the database in a way that the public can see it. A couple minutes later, the earthquakes already come and gone where you're at and people are not going to know everybody gets this text. And you know, if something big happens, 
the the cell service slows down a lot anyway because everybody's on their tr- phone trying to figure out. You're not going to have time to do that when your cell service sucks. Even if you're in the middle of Surrey like I am, if uh, that text message comes out, well, everyone and their grandma is going to be trying to text somebody to ask what's going on. You're not going to have time. If you get this text message that says an earthquake is coming, drop, cover, and hold on, you need to do it immediately. Once you're under your table, you can, you can you know, look on your phone and whatever, as long as you're holding on. In almost every circumstance, if you get this text message, you are going to feel the earthquake. You're going to feel the earthquake before you can learn anything else about it. It automatically opens the fire and ambulance doors. That's really cool. You know, if you are sitting right on the epicenter of the earthquake and this goes off, I mean, you may only have two seconds you won't have very much time. But if you do have 30 seconds, if you're far enough away from the earthquake that you have 30 seconds, that also means you're not going to experience the earthquake as intensely as those who are right on top of it, which means that that 30 seconds, not only do you have time to make an action, to make a decision that might save your life, but you're also dealing with a shaking that is more likely survivable so that any action you take has a higher chance of having an outcome that's positive. Um, so yeah, it automatically opens fire hall doors. Possible measures you want to also take into consideration is uh, stop traffic under bridges into tunnels. Like I don't know, but this one kind of I'm like, man, I do not want to be in the tunnel. So like my, I that alert goes off. Be- I'm like, I'm hitting the gas and getting out of there, man. I don't want to uh, be on the on the bridge either. You know, imagine being on the Fraser Bridge. <laughs> it's it's built for earthquakes, but I'm not. Uh, you make make sure to halt your trains and divert planes from landing. And of course, every time well, it starts to shake. Valves, closing valves, this is really important. We think about water with this, but think about natural gas lines. If it automatically closes those valves in, in the San Francisco earthquake in 1906, the vast majority of the damage was in a fire that happened in the city after the earthquake. I don't remember what caused that fire, but it is not a huge le- leap to imagine A natural gas line rupturing in a large earthquake, starting a fire in an urban area, even even like I know I know in the north, there aren't really any true urban areas. But even in Quinsel or Prince George, you know, you start a fire in in the core of the city and that could go pretty quickly, especially when roads are damaged and whatnot. Um, And so stopping closing those valves makes it so there's no natural gas in those lines so that if if a fire does start on a ruptured line, well, it's not going to keep fueling it. I always make sure to halt surgeries as well when I feel the shaking. Yeah, yeah, all those surgeries that you're performing up there in Wells. It's a bomb. Duck and cover. All right, so I have some stuff to share here, actually, as we talk about earthquakes and whatnot. Okay, so what we're looking at here is all of the earthquakes in and near Canada since 2000, so in the last 24 and a half years or so. Um, this early warning system will trigger for an earthquake that it estimates at a magnitude 5 or greater. And so this is, and then it will go out the whole area for um, like low end moderate shaking. So if it detects, oh, there's a 5.5 earthquake here, and I expect the moderate shaking to extend out 200 kilometers or so. Those are the people that are going to get the text message. These are the bridges that are going to be closed, et cetera. So Natural Resources Canada estimates that an uh, earthquake of this magnitude, which is 5.0 or greater, occurs in Canada on average once a year. This d- figure does not include offshore earthquakes or in earth- earthquakes in adjacent parts of the U.S., Today, well, earlier this week, the system became live in British Columbia. They are going to go live with it in parts of Ontario and Quebec later this year. So I just wanted to show there, is, there are a few earthquakes of this size that happen in Ontario and Quebec. Yeah, Ottawa um, got a good shaking a couple years back. Yeah, well, and even remember uh, New York got a good earthquake. Not that it's in Canada, but New York got a good earthquake earlier this year. Um, so these are the three earthquakes, 5.0 or greater, that have happened near Canada in in near Ontario and Quebec. They're all Quebec or New York, but these two near Ottawa, um, that's obviously a major urban center. This one in the Adirondacks, south of Montreal. Um, well, it has because- to be said too that Ottawa, well, in Ontario, eastern in general, they, the rock type there, the bedrock is 
uh, granitoid, mostly, right? It's very, very solid rock, very uniform, very prone to shaking hard for even a small earthquake. That's what, that is what I was going to say too. And not only is it prone to shaking harder than we're used to in the West here, but the shaking also gets transmitted further. The equivalent earthquake in Quebec and Ontario might be felt two to three times further away than here. And I think the earthquake risk, like it's pretty recent that we know about the earthquake risk in this region. And so buildings in British Columbia are a lot better prepared than buildings in this part of the, this part of the country. So you, I would expect to see more damage in Montreal from, say, a 6.5 earthquake, which would be really high end for there. But I would expect more da- damage in Montreal from something like that than in Vancouver. Pretty sure one of those Ottawa guys got pretty close to that. Yeah, this one's a 5.4, 5.1, and then this one in New York was 5.3. So Okay, so pretty, pretty solid, over fives. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, that's I set this map to only be over fives. I've never um, felt uh, a strong earthquake in BC. Growing up in Ontario, I felt earthquakes a number of times. You were talking about how Wells doesn't have a lot, and that, that really shows up well here. Um, there are a lot of small earthquakes in the BC interior. You know, all these mountains, all this faulting going on, like stuff is still moving around, but they're, they're typically very small earthquakes that you might be able to feel within 100 kilometers of the epicenter. But also there's so few people in northern BC that like, you know, if you get an earthquake in the right spot, there may only be 12 people within 100 kilometers of it. But the real earthquake hotspot for Canada is along the coast here. And then uh, this is the 6.8 that I survived in the Tacoma area. I actually lived about 15 kilometers from the epicenter of that and was in a building that was built in the 1950s. So that was pretty exciting. We did not have an early earthquake warning system there, and I was seven. So uh, that was a pretty wild ride. Um, but what we have here, all these red lines are tectonic plate boundaries. So, of course, British Columbia is on the North American plate. Off Vancouver Island, we have a smaller plate. Um, some sources call it two plates, but we'll just call it one for simplicity, the Juan de Fuca plate. This is what the the Wanda Fuca plate is diving under the North American plate like this, and it gets locked up. This is the movement, whereas the Pacific and North American plates are sliding next to each other. So this is the movement that creates the volcanoes like uh, Garibaldi, um, Mount Baker, Mount Rainier going down to the United States. Faulting. But this also creates a risk because as it descends, it gets caught on the upper plate and um, like the earthquake that happened in Japan in 2011, that was nine point something. This is this has the capability of creating earthquakes like that, um, and it will rupture likely the entire length of this red line from the north end of Vancouver Island down to uh, Northern California. Um, that'll be a very big earthquake. The last time it happened, we actually know was in January of 1700, and we know even down to the hour when it happened because it sent a tsunami all the way across the Pacific to Japan where they've been keeping records for that for a long time. Um, That earthquake decimated First Nations communities along the coast, um, including in Nia Bay here in Washington. Um, A landslide took out an entire First Nations community there. And when, when the white people showed up, we, they heard about all these legends and it wasn't until like the 1980s that science confirmed that those legends actually have a real source. It was this earthquake in 1700. Um, right. So that is, of course, the main risk to British Columbia, especially along the coast, is that big subduction zone earthquake. But that's not our only risk. You know, again, returning to this one near Tacoma, 6.8, that's a very big earthquake. When when that earthquake struck Seattle, unreinforced masonry, which is um, bricks, uh, collapsed onto cars. And, you know, if you're, if you're outside next to a brick building, you get a text that says, oh, earthquake's coming. Well, you look and you see the brick and you're like, well, that's not where I want to be. You know, this gives you 30 seconds to get away from that. Further off Vancouver Island, this outer red line, it's spreading apart here. 
But in 2011, there was a very strong earthquake in Haida Gwaii. I believe it was something in the 7 or maybe even 8 magnitude. And Yeah, here it is, 7.8. There he goes, yes. And it was felt all across northern BC. Like, it rattled Prince George. Good uh, places uh, were experiencing things falling off the shelves in Quenelle, places like that. And we here in Wells with our nice phyllitic rock that's very fractured. It's, you know, we got this great stratigraphy of very loose fractured rock it just off acts like a big shocking system a big shock absorber yeah. i've got the map up here uh didn't we'll feel a like. thing <laughs> didn't feel a thing here um it looks like from this 7.8 earthquake the moderate or the weak shaking was felt all the way by seismographs in washington and of course in the interior of bc up into alaska um, this was a. This is exactly the kind of earthquake that we're talking about that will trigger the alert. Now, if you're in Haida Gwaii here, it's pretty likely that you would not have gotten the message, first of all, because there's very little cell service up there. But second of all, just because you're so close, it pretty much happened right under the southern island there. Um, but if you're in Prince Rupert, Bella, Bella Coola, um, north end of Vancouver Island. These are all communities that would benefit even, well, I don't think it's active in Alaska yet, but these communities would have all benefited from that. Um, and if you're well, on that's going to act as your pre-tsunami warning, warning as well, right? So you're hanging out well, down yeah. like somewhere and you know, you're somewhere by Rupert or Angel Falls or somewhere you're on uh, Port Hardy or somewhere along the coast there and you suddenly this goes off on your phone should you be in cell service at least i would think okay time to get away from the you know you're in tofino time to get out follow the uh because there's a post that everywhere there uh tsunami evacuation plans and signs and things like that right so uh the other thing and you it might is notice important to i i just want to say on tsunamis um tsunamis do travel slower than earthquakes um you'd probably have like if if an earthquake were to happen on the Cascadia subduction zone here west of Vancouver Island and you're in Tofino, you'd probably have about 10 minutes. If you feel a large earthquake and you, well, if you feel an earthquake at all and you're on the coast, you go inland and ask questions later. Same thing as the earthquake text message. You do it and ask questions later. Now, one of the other good things you might notice uh, when you look at this is the Juan de Fuca plate. A lot of the activities on the far side of the plate, it's a long ways out there in the ocean off the coast, right? So yes. unlike, say, where you're in the San Andreas Fault and it's going right through parts of California uh, with faulting zones that go more or less right through San Francisco, right through major urban cities where centers where you know, get this well, arm. Well, not off, more or less. That go boundary. Off. You don't have time. It's happening right underneath you somewhere possibly, right? So yeah. the, for the most part here, we have earthquakes in BC that are going to be major, are going to happen offshore. We're going to have a little bit of time. Exactly. Um, and it's not more or less through San Francisco. It is through San Francisco. Yeah, um, exactly right. So the majority, the biggest earthquakes happen on this eastern line. But the last time the big earthquake happened was in 1700. Now, people will tell you, clickbaity, people will tell you that we're overdue for an earthquake. Well, that's not how it works. Okay. Like we are within the average range of the return period. But there's no such thing as overdue. We're not overdue for an earthquake. We're also not overdue for any volcanic eruption because that's not how it works. The These things don't is work on, a, to on a standard time where you can set your watch to it and be like, well, it's been 5,000 years and this happens once every 5,000 years, it says. Exactly. We are not overdue for anything. And anyone who tells you that is either lying or listen to a liar. Um, so that's, that's very important to note. So the majority of the earthquakes on the Juan de Fuca plate are actually on the outer edge where the plate is spreading from the Pacific plate. Um, these typically range like the biggest ones can be up to seven, that 7.8 up in Haida Gwaii was, um, was the strike split, uh, going laterally rather than out. So that's not the same kind of geologic scenario, but we even just had a swarm of earthquakes out here. There's also volcanoes out here um, underwater that are no risk to people on shore or even boats. But we had a swarm of earthquakes out here earlier this year, um, this being 2024, and some of those were felt on shore on Vancouver Island. And these are the kinds of things that you will get a text message for 
Um, of course, we would not have gotten one here in Surrey for one that's offshore because we were far enough, far enough away that we wouldn't have felt it. But this, this is really critical infrastructure. Um, there was an earthquake in California in 2022 that was 6.7, 6 point something, I want to say, maybe 6.5. It was up near like the Redwoods on the northwest coast. The earthquake warning system worked beautifully there. The nearest town was too close to get notified for it, but like Redding, California inland, Crescent City, California, further up the coast, Medford, Oregon, all of these communities that some people like in Crescent City, City they for sure felt shaking, but further out, like Reading and whatnot, um, not everyone did, but everyone got the text message to be ready. And this is the same exact system that we use here. British Columbia and Natural Resources Canada are using the same system developed by the U.S. Geological Survey for these early alerts. And so we know how well it will work because it's already being used in California, Oregon, and Washington, and it works pretty well. People get all alarmed. We have a little bit of a, a swarming of earthquakes we had earlier this year that you just mentioned, you know, they're like, oh my God, there's earthquakes happening off the shore. And maybe this means the big one's coming. And, and you know, people have to realize that these subduction zones, they're not quite uh, like how you imagine it. You, you think that more activity means that we're building towards something, but uh, that's not necessarily the case here, actually, that releasing some steam is generally a positive thing in a zone like this. So, Having yeah, some, there is something having some earthquake activity that. happening uh, continuously off and on is a very positive sign. It's like, and if that stops and there's no earthquake activity and you're like, wow, 30 years have gone by, then you might be able to say, hey, maybe we're getting overdue for an earthquake. But, you know, that's how, that's how these things work. They, you can't set your time to it and be like, well, an earthquake happens once every 200 years. No, an earthquake happens when the conditions are, are there and the pressure is sufficient and it releases and... And also to your point about, oh, earthquakes form higher risk. Well, I just want to show you this shows here on in this map area specifically, there are 155 earthquakes that have happened since 2000. Not a single one of these, including that 7.8 up in Haida Gwaii, not a single one of these caused the big one to happen. Okay. 155 earthquakes in the last 24 years, and these are only the ones that are 5.0 or greater. So, no, an earthquake swarm offshore is not really a sign of anything on any other fault plane. We could be one, two, three thousand years before the the big earthquake happens. I mean, I'm not. I don't believe that, but that's entirely right. possible, right? the The odds are better that it that anybody watching this show dies of natural causes before that earthquake happens. It could happen. It could happen, you know, while I'm driving through the Massey tunnel to go up to Vancouver for my ICBC appointment later today, it could happen, but the risk is not especially high. This is something that you need to be aware of because preparing ahead of time saves lives. You need to know what to do, but you can't be afraid of it. I'm going camping on the Oregon coast next weekend. You know, and that's that's prime tsunami hazard. This is where the shaking will be the most from this kind of earthquake. But I'm going camping out there. I'm not afraid of it, but I will pay attention to the signs and know what to do if it happens. And if you if you want to stay away, that's fine. But like I literally live three kilometers from the water. I'm not in a tsunami hazard zone because it's I'm up a hill, but even when you don't live in an earthquake zone like here in Wells, you know, I'm not concerned that we're ever going to have the big earthquake here. There's a lot of things that could we're more likely to have a tornado in this town than an earthquake. That's absolutely yes. true. Yes. Yeah. Um the law, the reality is here in Wells is that if we have some big event happen down on the coast that completely mashes infrastructure, the food delivery, transportation systems for gasoline, distribution of goods, those things can be disrupted throughout the province in general, right? So I yes. I tend to think of it like this when I why I have big sacks of rice in my cupboards and canned goods and whatnot, try to have months of food, even if it means that you're you're eating like the third world for a while, eating rice and lentils only, at least, you know, if you get to a point where you're three months into the survival situation and you're eating rice and lentils, but it's like, okay, so imagine this. We got a, a wildfire is happening on the Barkerville Highway. They're like, well, you can't go down the Barkerville Highway. And then during that, 
but then we lose electricity. Okay, now we've lost power because of the fire. Oh, and now there's a major earthquake that's happened down the coast. Uh-oh, now infrastructure is screwed up. They don't have the resources to get to our problem. You know, like multiples, well, and, and multiples even, of emergencies can compound each other that way, right? So this is why I suggest to people who live in BC, even if you don't live in an area where you think there's going to be earthquakes, you know, you I picked the most the most thunderstormy and least earthquakey place in the highest place I could find to live in. And uh, all three of those things I chose for a reason. You know, my friends who live down in on uh, those little islands down in the Gulf where they have an earthquake down there, Sure, they survived. They're fine. Their house is above tsunami level. There was no tsunami. That earthquake can change the water table, and suddenly they don't have fucking water coming out of their taps. Yeah, right? yeah. Well, in the water table, I've known people in Idaho, in East Idaho, up by Yellowstone, who their wells were impacted by earthquakes in California because of how the geology is connected. They did not feel the earthquake. No, Nobody nearby felt the earthquake, but an earthquake in California impacted their well. Everybody should ha be able to be self-sufficient for two weeks. It was just enough um, to drain their water. Right, right. Or cloud their water. You know, now, now you had a well that you could drink from and now you can't drink from it. Um, a landslide goes into the community reservoir and now all your waters. Yeah, I mean, that happened in Vancouver in 2006, I want to say it was, or seven where there was a large, large storm came through and it knocked trees down in Stanley Park and all this and that. And it made a big wild landslide up there on the North Shore. And that went into the water system. And suddenly everybody in Vancouver was turning on their water and having turbid uh, brown water coming out of the tap, right? Well, and one last note reservoir. on this. You can, even, you can even have, and Vancouver's a little insulated from this because we're a major port. You can even have like snowstorms in the mountains cut off the... Uh, your, your weather can be totally fine, but you can have snowstorms in the mountains that cut off the transportation corridors. Um, I've seen this in eastern Washington where, um, like, you could, you could still get dry goods and stuff, but it was very hard to get produce a couple of times in the winter because all of the surrounding mountains, you couldn't really get into any fresh produce in from Southern California. Um, I, would, I would think the atmospheric river event three years ago would be a good example of what yes. an earthquake might actually look like in BC. You know, take away the flooding, but just look at the, the impact to infrastructure. Especially in the interior, right? Um, because again, Vancouver being a port city and we didn't have much damage in the, in the lower mainland. I know there was flooding up by east of Abbotsford and stuff like that. That's what this film is all about. Duck and cover. Natural Resources Canada has this really cool thing where you can see the live seismograph feeds. So I picked one out on Vancouver Island, and there's not really any earthquakes going on. This is all background noise, but you can see this is this is the last minute of data, and it's just uh, loading every second. And uh, you can see the shaking there during the during the earthquake swarm a couple of months ago. This was really fun to watch because you'd see an earthquake show up on this every. Uh, every 10 or 15 minutes or so. Then this is the last 10 minutes of data and the last hour of data. You can also pull up the last day, but it's not live. Um, so if you're, if you're really into geology like me and Joey and you're, you just want something to put on the background on the TV while you're listening to your Iron Maiden, um, this is a really cool resource. Um, this is not something in the United States that I've seen. So there are like citizen science earthquake networks or seismograph networks that you can do this with. But this is, I, I literally just Googled natural resources, Canada, live seismograph. It takes you to a map of all the options. And I just picked one on Vancouver Island. There's um, I'll hit back here. So I'm zoomed into Southwest BC. All these blue ones are currently active. So there's not much up by you there in wells, but Haida Gwaii, I could pick one here in the lower mainland, Queen Elizabeth Park in, in Vancouver. And this is not just in BC, this is all over the country, Edmonton, um, down by Cranbrook. And then you get more of them over in the east where the earthquake risk picks up again, like around Quebec and Montreal. So this is a really cool resource that, uh, this is not going to give you an early warning for an earthquake and like the odds of a big earthquake happening while you're watching it are pretty low. <laughs> just because no, but of the your odds of, of life. an earthquake happening aren't uh, that low in general though. I mean, uh, I think BC right. has 4,000 earthquakes per year, right? So on average 11 a day 
you know, the vast majority too little to be felt, but they would all be strong enough to turn up on some of these seismographs. So if you were watching this long enough during the day, there's a good chance that you're going to see something pop up. Yeah. And, and if somebody's asking like, well, how do I know if it's an earthquake? Like we don't have a good, we don't have a good example showing up in the last hour, but uh, you'll know like the, the shaking, this also scales. So like right now there's not very much shaking, so you can see all of it. But when there's big shaking, the, the most, most of the line will show as a flat line because it, the scale of how big this is changes. And what this does is it just shows ground motion. Um, I don't, I don't remember exactly what units they are, but you'll, you'll know if you're watching this, you'll know if there's an earthquake happening. One of our uh, moderators in Interior Weather and Wilderness Watches has been there from the very beginning is Angelique. Angelique is a geologist who runs a, she runs a store in Quinell that sells uh, geological equipment, basically, you know, like uh, things that like gold pans and eyepieces and, you know, hydrochloric acid, anything you might need for your prospecting and for your your. You know, and she does claim work and things like that. So she's also a, you know, she's a geologist and she's got a seismograph in her office. So often when there is an earthquake felt in the interior, uh, we have within Interior Weather and Wilderness Watchers, somebody who's right there is like, whoa, it's actually showing up on my graph. And hers is strong enough that that solid, like heavy trucks going down the street will will register just a little bit. All right, now now I'm going to have to show the uh, Citizen si Science Seismograph Network. Um, if anybody wants to drop a cool, like, $600 on me, I will buy myself one of these. That's what this film is all about. Duck and cover. So it's called a Raspberry Shake, and that's because it's built on a Raspberry Pi. So this is the network of Citizen Science seismographs and so what that means is they are owned by people like you and me um and it's a little bit lower quality but like not that much lower and so you can see somebody's got one in prince george there's a bunch here in the lower mainland and around Vic victoria down by seattle a few out at haida 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 right that's haida correct haida. um prince rupert not um, queen so, charlotte islands you are saying it incorrectly well, I, I do know that <laughs> uh, <laughs> had a mispronounced Haida Gwaii say Queen Charlotte yeah. so this is the live feed for um, one right across the border from me um, this is the last 10 minutes I believe we could go up here and so these, these are available it's called Raspberry Shake and you can also see what earthquakes are picked up like this this little one in the interior 2.3 um, 187 kilometers from Coquitlam. There's like Merritt and Kamloops are closer. I don't know why that's the closest town. This one in that Prince could George. be from blasting at the mine. Yeah, well, that's another thing is the blasting at mines does show up on on all seismographs. On that would be this network, that would be in the right area to be near the uh, the mine south of Ashcroft. Look at this. This one does show an earthquake. Um, this Prince George one, there was an earthquake there about six minutes ago. There's not enough seismographs because you need three seismographs to be able to know how big and where it was. There's not enough to on this network to show uh, those details. But there was an earthquake or quarry blasting or something near Prince George about six or seven minutes before we recorded this. Some so event cool. that caused it. Yeah, not everything that shows up right. there is an earthquake, but... Yeah. The seismograph detected shaking. And this is going to be more than a truck going past. This is this is ground shaking caused by either an earthquake or a quarry blast or something like that. So yeah, I, I really like spike. this network. I'd like to I'd like to get one of these sometime, but uh you know, I have a family and that comes first. <laughs> That's what this film is all about. Duck and cover. Canada's early warning system is now in effect. Uh make sure if if uh you want to get a raspberry shake get one man this is pretty cool stuff i mean uh, i got my own weather weather sensors back here and you know it's it's not exactly the same thing but uh the, the technology is becoming more and more accessible is the point i'm making uh to do your own citizen science at home whether it's lighting detection whether it's uh having your own weather station having whether it's having a seismograph this and that thank you meteorologist mark for talking this morning 
Uh, I'm Joey, only Caribbean weather dude. Hit like, share, subscribe, and uh, maybe we'll see you next time here on the channel, everybody. Thanks. Uh, have yourself a great weekend. First, you duck. duck. And then, you cover. You duck and duck. cover. Tight. Duck and cover under the table. Duck. It's a bomb. Duck and cover. He did what we all must learn to do. You. And you. And you. And you. Duck. And cover.